Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan. By the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment. And by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible in part by Pfizer. discussed more uh, about what sound is, uh, the, the wave character of sound, and more importantly, what music is, what makes certain sounds sound pleasing to the ear. And we talked about scale systems and how instruments, uh, because they produce a very complex sound, how the, the complex waveform that they're producing uh, is pleasing to the ear. And I want to quickly remind you that we, uh, l last time we started with a plot just like this, on the top there uh, is a, a waveform in time. So time marches from the left to the right. And because this is a stereo, uh, uh, a stereo signal, we have two signals. But you can pay attention to just one of them. And this is a couple of minutes long, this one here. And if you remember last time, we expanded it out and saw all the different time scales in music. And uh, as we as we follow this piece, we see a very complicated waveform. And this is actually sound. These are sound waves. This is what a speaker is doing in time. It's, the diaphragm is moving. Uh, this is what's happening in the air between the speaker and your ear. And this is what your ear is doing. Your eardrum is vibrating, very much like this vibration here. T today, we're going to uh, continue where we left off and talk about another feature of waves we didn't talk about this at all last week, it has to do with interference. Uh, waves are uh, very special things, and uh, they, they have features that we will show later in this hour uh, will underlie all of quantum mechanics, and we'll, we'll get to that in due time. The feature of waves that makes them interesting uh, with regard to quantum mechanics and also music, uh, what makes them beautiful is that they're not in one place. Waves have a feature of being everywhere at one time. And last time, we, one of the simplest demonstrations of a wave was on this big, long rope, an oscillation like this. And if you, if you hit it differently, you'll, you can get an oscillation like this. Now, those two modes, you'll notice this mode is a little bit faster. And here's one that's faster yet. But you can see a very regular pattern in this wave. Now, this doesn't look like a wave, but in fact, it's a wave going both away from me and reflecting off the wall and coming toward me. These are called modes, or normal modes, and all instruments have normal modes. But where is this wave anyway? It's everywhere throughout the rope. The wave is distributed. And that's, this is a particular feature of waves that's a departure from our, our notion of <coughs> Newtonian physics, which is basically the physics of throwing a baseball across the room. The baseball is in a particular place at any given time. And knowing, knowing its position and its velocity, we can calculate everything about that baseball. Um, waves are distributed everywhere. And w one of the most ubiquitous examples is uh, uh, waves, on the surface of, waves on the surface of water. We're looking here. Uh, the camera is looking at um, light that's bouncing through this water. And you can see the, the standard pattern of waves. And the, the wave is everywhere, and that's what I want, that's what I want to motivate. And uh, there, there are many types of interference of waves. Interference means that you have two or more waves that are combining in such a way to either reinforce each other or cancel each other out. Now, uh, you've probably heard of noise cancellation headphones uh, where that you can wear on airplanes to cancel the low rumble. And they do exactly that. There's, 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 there are sound waves coming into your ears, and, the, and the, these headphones will pick up those sound waves and turn them around. It'll add their own sound waves to cancel. Um, we have s several um, demonstrations to show that very vividly. Now, in, in, this, in this demonstration here, I have a single annoying tone being played. Uh, it's being piped into two speakers. <clears throat> now, these speakers are a meter apart. And you remember last time uh, we, we talked about the, the the characteristic length of a sound wave is like this. It's about the size of us, about the size of an instrument. Well, that's true of these waves that are coming out of these two speakers. Now, the neat thing about this demonstration is as, as, as I'm projecting these sound waves, 
you can move your head around and hear it get louder or softer depending on where your head is. So let me just do that. Move your head around. It definitely changes over the course of about that, that, that much of a distance. That's an interference effect. If I unplug one of the speakers, you don't hear it at all. It's constant everywhere. Okay. But when, when we plug them both in, we find that the signals tend to cancel each other out more or less in certain areas, and they get louder in other areas. So again, this is a feature of waves. Waves are everywhere, and so they can add or subtract with each other if you have multiple sources. This, this here is another uh, demonstration of wave interference, this time not in space, but in time. So uh, these, are, these are homemade tuning forks made out of aluminum, precisely engineered by the demonstration lab to produce a, a very sinusoidal tone. We have a microphone to pick up the sound wave. That's a single tone, a sinusoid, if, for those of you that, that remember your trigonometry. We have another one here, pretty much the same thing. One sound wave. Again, there is a very high oscillation there. You're seeing it on the scope, and you're, you can't really perceive it, but your ear is moving at a very high frequency here at about a kilohertz, 1,000 times a second. Now, the, the interference we're going to describe here is that the, those two notes, by the way, sounded exactly alike, didn't they? They're not. They're actually, they're actually a tiny bit off. And you can really tell that when we bang them together. Let's make it even more stark. And the way to do this, of course, is, well, you're, only you're very lucky if you can machine pieces of aluminum like this to have them exactly equal. But they, they have been machined that way. And we put a little silly putty to make them heavier. Remember, the frequency goes down with mass. So we're making it slightly heavier. And now we should hear a nice ripple, a beat note. You can really see that up there on the scope. That the, that what's happening is, in time now, there's an interference. It's loud and soft in time, and loud and soft. We, of course, all know this when, when you play two notes real close together on the piano, you can hear this too, especially low notes. Can you hear that warble? Wah, 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 wah. That's called a beat note, and it's the same type of interference. And that's why we typically, that, that type of a beat note doesn't sound pleasing to the ears, so you don't see too much music written, especially in the low end with notes right next to each other like that. Up here, it's not so bad because it's, uh, the warble is so fast that your ear can't really pick it up. Now, I want to take this to an, another level, though, and that has, has a little bit to do with how we perceive sound waves. When there are multiple sources, what sound wave do we hear? Is there more than one? Do we hear them all together? Well, when we play simple chords on a piano, that's a C major chord. There's three notes I'm playing in the piano. Which note do you hear? Well, you hear all three. There is complex interferences going on in your head. But you hear that as a pleasing chord with three separate notes. Th there are other examples that, that basically give the, uh, make music sound beautiful. And it's this interference of the sound waves that, re that, re that really is behind that. I'm going to play a clarinet tone. We all recognize this. Look at all the, look at all the notes that are being played. You thought that was a single note, didn't you? Let me pause it in the middle there. As you see, this is frequency, by the way. We see all kinds of tones. And that's what makes a clarinet sound like a clarinet. One is much stronger than the other, and that's, that's why we identify that as a particular note. But uh, in, this way, in this sound file up here, I only played the, the beginning. This is very interesting over here. And what, what's going to happen here is we're going to hear all the different tones that make up a clarinet independently of each other. Pay attention to the bottom also, what's happening. So you can see exactly what notes are being highlighted. So even though we identify that note by that first tone right here, 
that was the note we identify this, and that looks like it's about, I'm going to guess, about 190 hertz. That's probably, I don't know, it's a, like an E, I think, or a low F. That's the note we identify, but it didn't sound like a clarinet until we got all this stuff way up there. In a sense, our brain is processing this super, very complex superposition, and we hear all these notes at once. Now, there's another neat example of this same phenomena. And this is, this is fun, because I'm going to have you try to guess what instrument it is. It's a very simple wave. It's just a single note. And we're going to be adding more. And, and then here, everybody will probably know what it is. But try to guess what it is from the beginning. I'll turn it up. What instrument is this? And you can look down here and see how simple the waveform is. Go ahead and yell. Xylophone? All right. You really hear it after that last one. It's those high, those high notes that really give it, that, that really give it away. That first, the, the first strike, though, it uh, didn't sound at all like a guitar. It sounded like a bell of some sort, even the second one. So the point I want to make here is that, again, this is, this, is, this is a property of waves. They can be all at once. They can be in many different states at the same time. You can think of it that way, OK? Now, the reason I'm going through this exercise, it's, 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 it's for a good reason, because um, I, I want to evolve into a discussion of a different form of wave that arises in quantum mechanics. And it turns out appreciation of superposition goes a long way toward understanding quantum mechanics, believe it or not. Now, one last neat, uh, neat demonstration here. And this is not a real instrument. But this is, a, this is a, an electronically generated sound. Um, it looks very complicated. And let's just listen to it and comment on it. I'll probably play it a couple of times. descending, never, never reaching the final destination. <laughs> it's an awful feeling when you hear this. <laughs> now, it's not simply a matter of playing a downward scale and repeating it. That definitely has a jump upward and downward. This one always, it never seems to have a, a discrete hop, but it's always going down. And the reason, you can see from the bottom here, play it again and I'll maybe turn it down. What's happening, all these notes are being played, but you can see pretty much, we're always hearing the same range of notes between about, uh, it doesn't matter, this is 100 hertz and 1,000 hertz. All the notes are within that range, but each one of them, there's several of them, they're all descending. But new ones come up at the high end, and the old ones disappear at the low end. And you might notice that when you hear this, your mind tends to make a jump. Occasionally, you're following the low note, and then, whoop, I'm going to follow now another high one. Everybody's different. Everybody hears this different, I think. And you tend to pick, you t your mind tends to pick on one of these guys, and then as soon as it gets, the volume gets low, it might jump onto a high one. So this is not a real instrument. No instruments really do this. It's electronically generated. But it illustrates the fact that perception of sound waves is very complicated. And the idea that we have complex superpositions of things going on, our mind picks out one of them and sticks with it. Okay? That, that uh, sound file should remind you of these, one of these wonderful Escher, Escher paintings, <laughs> infinitely descending. And I'm going to return to the idea of what makes this also appear to descend. And it has to do with perspective. We're drawing a three, uh, Escher has drawn wonderfully a three-dimensional object in two dimensions, so you can get away with some tricks, okay? And, well, I, I, can, I can draw that 
I can draw right now. We've all had fun drawing a cube, drawing an ice cube or three-dimensional box on a two-dimensional piece of paper. Oop, better draw that line. <clears throat> OK, I, I didn't add perspective here because I wanted to make it ambiguous. Is this cube, is the front face pointing down and to the left or up and to the right? It's a matter of your perception. And you tend to lock onto one or the other and stick with it, but you can flop back and forth. Very much like these, these, uh, these, these interesting sound waves I, I just showed you. OK, so what we have here is a water tank, a very shallow pool of water. And as I said before, the camera is looking, uh, looking at the transmitted light through the water. And uh, I ha there's, there's a hinge right here that will be vibrating very fast. And uh, it's vibrating so fast that you can't really see these waves. But we also have a strobe light, again, to slow things down in a sense. And you can see these water waves pass, uh, pass through the surface here. Now, um, one thing that's very interesting with water waves is that water waves, like anything, will, will give you interference. And we don't really see that here. We just see what's what are called plane waves. You might see these uh, if on a calm day on a pond when you're in the middle of the pond. You just see plane waves moving along. But uh, we can make more complicated patterns. Here what I'm doing is constricting this, this wave uh, uh, basically by putting two pieces of metal in, the, in this pond. But there, there's a leak right here. Where the, where the water waves can, uh, are allowed to come out. And you can see that, you can see that clear pattern. Well, it looks like the background lights are making this hard to see. That's maybe a little better. Um, you can see this pattern, and it's becoming circular as, as, the waves, as the waves spread out. In fact, what these waves are doing is uh, it's a very complex interference called diffraction, uh, where even, even though you have a single source here, the waves uh, don't cast a simple shadow of their pattern. They actually spread out. They, they spread out in this direction here. Um, an even better one, and we're going to quickly move on to quantum mechanics before you know it, believe it or not, is, uh, is this one here. And here we have, this is a little easier to see. Uh, down at the bottom, there are basically two holes in the aperture. So I've let the wave go through in two places. And so you see these circular waves coming off, just like throwing a stone in a pond. You get circular waves. But now these waves are going to interfere. There are two sources. And if you, look, if you look way up here, you'll see there are certain places where the wave is not even present. Here, it's really present. You can see that. You can see bright and dark, bright and dark real strongly. Here, not so much. There's an interference going on. Okay? So this is, a, this is a classic example of what's called two-source interference. It's the simplest form of interference, interference between two waves. And it's very vivid in water in that, in that type of system. Um, that happens with light as well. In fact, um, this, this is a, uh, a slide. You might, might, might not see it so clearly. It's a slide that has a, a, a fine powder on it. It's a spore that's, uh, so it used to be living at some time. Uh, it's, it's, uh, is this anthrax or is it? No, it's not anthrax. Okay, it's sort of like that though. It's a very fine powder that's been that's been put on put on a uh, put on a slide, and I'm going to send a laser beam through the uh, through this, and we've all seen these green laser pointers. This is from China. This guy, <laughs> <laughs> and theorists are not allowed to use it either. It's very actually very dangerous, uh, but I'll point it this way. I promise. Um, but in the question and answer session, I'll be armed with this. Be careful. <laughs> so what's going on here, you can see all those rings. You can see some of the rings are bright, and the other ones are dark. That's the same phenomenon we saw over there. It's an interference phenomenon. Light is a wave, after all. It's a much smaller wave, so you have to have much smaller objects to show the interference. You've seen light interference when you wear sunglasses, and you look through your rear window in your car sometimes. You see. You see that on the road when, when the sunlight uh, produces bands of dark and bright light. This I borrowed from a, it's, it's a website called Physics 2000. It was developed at the University of Colorado. Um, and this is an animation. This isn't real. So, so this, is, this is supposed to be a laser. And you can see two slits that will allow that light through. And when you turn the laser on, boy, if it were only this easy. 
uh, you, you'll end up seeing interference patterns in the far field. And if you change the slit parameters, you'll see, you'll see a difference in a different interference pattern. Um, and again, this is very much like what I showed with the fine powder on the slide. And we're going to try to do the same thing with electrons. Okay? Electrons. They're kind of like light. Electrons are what cast your image on the TV screen. Right? So it's a little like light. What we have back here looks like a light bulb. Uh, it's very much like a light bulb. And it's more like a TV tube. And on the far side, uh, you might be able to see it real uh, in addition to the camera image. There's what's called a phosphor screen on the front end. And a phosphor screen is, is made up of a material that when you, when you bombard it with electrons, it gives off light. Electrons have energy, and it gets converted into light with this, uh, with this white screen. That bright dot there is the result of a bunch of electrons hitting the screen. <clears throat> and as I change, as it turns out, I change the voltage on these electrons, we see a different pattern emerge. And you can clearly see that. This is basically electrons doing the same thing that the laser beam did. There's interference going on. Okay. So it turns out that electrons seem to interfere in a very similar way as light waves. And it should be a surprise to you. Well, electrons, how come they're behaving like waves? Well, this is, this is this was the status of physics, I would say, 100, 120 years ago, between, between 80 and 120 years ago. People were observing these things with electrons. They seemed to look just like waves. And that was a big problem, because we thought of electrons as very much like baseballs, following the laws of Newtonian mechanics. If you know the force on the electron, you can follow exactly what it's doing. Well, this is, of course, the uh, ushering in the era of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a wave theory that describes particles. And it, it turns out you can, get, you can go a long way in understanding quantum mechanics from our knowledge of regular old wave-like phenomena. And uh, I, I like to think of it as, as similar to, uh, similar to uh, trying to understand the physics of music to, to, to appreciate music. They're not the same thing. And, uh, we showed these music sound waves, uh, very complicated, but uh, uh, Beethoven and others, they certainly did not write these sound waves out when they were composing their works. They compose in terms of notes. And even if you can't read music, you can't read notes. And by the way, these are a few of my favorite pieces written down, not in terms of sound waves, but in terms of notes. And if you know how to read music, you'll. <clears throat> so this is a. <laughs> This I got from, from, from P.D.Q. Bach, of course. But uh, no, uh, the, the system of musical notes is a way that we can make sense to these very complex sound waves. And I would say musical notes are akin to the mathematics behind wave mechanics. You don't even need to read this stuff to, uh, to appreciate what it sounds like. And there's another one there. Um, <clears throat> now, quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a wave theory, and it can get pretty complicated. This is a random page out of one of my favorite quantum mechanics texts. You can actually <laughs> see up here. It's the quantum theory of damping, the density operator methods. And it's true that when we're taught quantum mechanics, we start from a mathematical description of the underlying waves that describe these electrons. Um, on the other hand, I don't think it should be taught that way. I, I, I think we should appreciate quantum mechanics before we dive into the mathematics. Just like when you look at the ripple patterns on the surface of a pond, you can appreciate that with not, without having to understand exactly what the wave speed is and how interference happens and the mathematical description. It's very difficult for even working physicists or engineers to describe mathematically the pattern of a wave on the ocean crashing on the shore. That's really, really complicated. At least as complicated as anything in quantum mechanics, I would say. Um, so I, I want to. Uh, Talk about quantum mechanics now from that perspective, from a perspective of appreciating very simple, uh, uh, very simple phenomena like wave interference. And as you'll see, it, it goes a long way uh, to describing what's happening. Now, in fact, sorry, uh, I would say the, the uh, qu quantum mechanics can be can really be reduced to only a few laws, and there's no mathematics here, and that's the great thing. The whole essence of quantum mechanics, I like to describe it in, in terms of two golden rules. And the first golden rule is uh, 
something that we're already familiar with now, this idea of superposition. That's why I spent a lot of time talking about superposition. Quantum waves, I'll describe what they are in a moment. We don't really know exactly what they are, but I'm going to describe what we think we mean when we say quantum waves in a moment. Quantum waves can be in different states at the same time, a lot like all the overtones of a guitar. You hear them all at the same time. Uh, so there, there's some notation here. Again, this is not really math. This just means that there is an atom or there's, there's something, an electron in going in two paths. It can go in both paths at the same time. Okay. So this is a so-called quantum superposition. And this is the simplest superposition there is. It's a superposition of two things. This, this is a, uh, you might recognize this as a, a very simple model of an atom, a single atom. It has a nucleus and it has a bunch of electrons. Actually, this blue dot is supposed to denote an electron. It's one electron. It's in both states at the same time. Again, electrons are waves, so we're going to prepare it like that. Now, like I say, the simplest superposition only involves two states. So this superposition is in the state we can label it anything we want, A and B, 0 and 1, up and down, left and right. I call it 0 and 1. Uh, this is a superposition of 0 and 1. And the numbers up in front tell you how much 0 there is and how much 1 there is. Okay? We can tune that. And in fact, there is wave mechanics behind, behind this state. But forget about that. It really doesn't matter. We can prepare this kind of a state in a single, in a single atom or a very small system that behaves according to quantum mechanics, a single electron. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, that's rule number one, which is not so revolutionary. It's just a wave. It's a little strange kind of wave, but it's a wave nevertheless. Now, um, things kind of come crumbling down when we talk about rule number two. Rule number two says that rule number one works as long as you're not looking. <clears throat> that's, that's quantum mechanics. These two together. And it's uh, obviously revolutionary because this is the only physical theory in all the sciences, in all of human existence. It's the only theory that, that has a special place for the observer. We tend to think of a tree falling in the forest, the old, uh, the old adage, a tree falling in the forest. If nobody was there, did it make a sound? Well, quantum mechanically, the answer is no. The answer is the, you, you can have both. You can have two situations at the same time. And when you do observe it, you actually affect the system. And when you observe this type of a system, we see 0 or 1. <clears throat> now, there are a lot of ways to look at quantum mechanics. This is one way. I think it really goes a long way without having to go into the math. I don't think you have to, to appreciate the beauty and, and the essence of quantum mechanics. Um, another way to look at it, you've, many of you have heard that quantum mechanics says that everything is a wave. There's a wave-particle duality. Even the baseball I talked about, that's a wave, wave-particle duality. Well, here we see wave and here we see particle. A wave can be in superposition states, that's fine. But a particle is never in a superposition state. The baseball is here. It's not here. It's not here and here, certainly not. Rule number two is the particle description. It allows us to have a particle description of anything. So if we did somehow prepare the baseball in both my hands at the same time, as soon as we look at it, it's going to go into one or the other. And it's really like a particle. Okay? And this is the way it is. Uh, nobody's happy with this. Einstein, I would say, was the least happy. <laughs> and he spent most of, uh, most of the latter part of his life trying to refute quantum mechanics, or at least saying that it's, this is just an approximation. There's something more to it. He was wrong. It turned out every, quantum mechanics has passed every possible test to refute these two laws. Okay? So, um, so, so what is this quantum wave anyway? Uh, what does it mean? It's not like a sound wave. We don't hear a quantum wave. Well, um, the mathematical description says that this, this kind of a wave here, being in 0 and 1, it's, it's what's called a probability wave. Okay? And the reason we talk about it as a probability wave is rule number 2. If this is a wave, then these two numbers, a and alpha and beta here, they tell you the probability of observing a 0 and 1. So again, this is another, uh, 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 another unique feature of quantum mechanics. It has probabilities built into it. That's unlike anything else. So there's something noisy in there. There's somebody, there's somebody inside every atom tossing a coin. There's some probability going on. And that's very strange. And so for those of you that aren't so familiar with probability, there's a nice demonstration here of we're going to develop a probability wave function here. So we have. Uh, I'll just leave this here. I can just leave it here? Yeah. yeah. OK. Oh, thanks, Warren. <coughs> um, we have here a funnel. <laughs> and 
uh, a co collection of nails, rather uniformly spaced, and I'm going to pour a bunch of marbles into here. And now each marble is a particle. It has a definite position. Um, but when we, when we end up pouring marbles in here, they're going to bounce off the nails in random ways. Work its way all the way down and find a final position, final resting position there. Okay? This marble, I, it, again, sorry if you can't see it, you can come up later. It landed over here. There's about 20 different channels where it can land. And it's largely random. So when we put in several, we start to build up a very interesting pattern. Most of them are going in the middle, but you see some on the left, some on the right. Okay, so the problem is, how do you describe this system? If I put one marble in there, uh, I, I want you to tell me, where is, where is it going to end up? You're going to say, I have no idea. I can give you a probability where it's going to end up. It's probably not going to go all the way to this end. That means it has to bounce to the right on every nail. That's very unlikely. It's like flipping 100 coins and getting heads every time. It can happen, but you have to you know, wait a few billion years for it to happen, maybe. Um, so we describe these situations in terms of probabilities. And you can see, that's a fun sound too. We're starting, we're starting to build up a distribution. It looks a little, it's not a wave. No, there's no reason to call it a wave, but this is what a quantum wave is. It's a wave that tells you the opportunity for measurement. When we look at an individual particle, it's going to be in one place. And so the quantum wave we're always talking about, this wave-particle duality, involves a probability wave. Very abstract and very strange. Um, and for, for the rest of the talk, I really want to talk about how that can be useful. Uh, I could talk on for, what do we have, until 5 o'clock tonight? <laughs> I, we, we could go on and on to talk about quantum physics and all different aspects of it. I really want to uh, do a few things, though. and, and talk about how this, this type of a superposition and, and uh, the, the dynamics that underlies this very simple system can be useful to build new computers. And you might be guessing where I'm going here. Um, I, I, I called this, let's use, the, let's use the fancy laser in case you're, anybody's falling asleep real bright here. Um, this is sometimes called a quantum bit. Uh, many of you know what a bit is, a binary digit, zero or one. It's the simplest way to encode information. And of course, information in computers is encoded in binary. Of course, lots of zeros and ones, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, et cetera. You can encode your name that way, your social security number, and so forth. That's what information is, zeros and ones. Well, if we take advantage of quantum mechanics, we can store 0 and 1 at the same time. If we put a lot of them together, we can store lots of numbers at the same time. So there's, the, there's an opportunity for massively parallel processing. You didn't like that, huh? He's got, he's got to pay the insurance bills, so, <laughs> um, so So there's an opportunity to do massive parallel computing. And again, that's another topic we could, we could talk for weeks and weeks on, the topic of quantum computing. But um, in, in, instead of that, I want, I, I want to go into the lab now and show you a real quantum bit. Uh, and this will be in the form of a single atom. Now, these two rules. <clears throat> What's the problem with quantum bits? The problem is it's hard to have a a quantum system unobserved. It's hard not to have rule number two happen, even though you didn't know it was going to happen. This is dying, so sorry, I'm going <laughs> to. So it, it's very hard to get rule number two to turn off. <laughs> <laughs> now, the thing I didn't tell you about rule number two is that it doesn't have to be you, it can be anybody. If anybody looks, everything's off. It's a particle. And it doesn't even have to be a conscious being. If I have a baseball in two places at the same time in a room filled with air, there are air molecules, believe me, going all around. They're going to collide into the baseball. Now, where is the baseball? If the baseball's over here, these air molecules will just go right through. But if the baseball's here, the air molecules are going to bounce off it. And so now all of a sudden, the air is involved. 
the air, it did make a measurement. We don't think of nitrogen as being conscious. But the air knows which side the baseball's on. So now we have to include the air. Pretty soon, the air is going to hit the other end of the room, and that wall is going to feel that air molecule. Well, did it or didn't it? What part of the wall felt that air? So you can see there's a problem here with the rule number two. Eventually, this system is going to leak into the environment. And to make quantum systems useful, to actually harness quantum systems, you have to shield them from the environment. And so we're going to go to the lab in a moment and, uh, and show you a single atom that's held electromagnetically that's in just such an environment. Hi, Steve. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself, Steve? Uh, I'm going to unplug you for a minute, Steve. So, can you see us? Uh, geez, now I'm, now I'm stuck. How do we do this? Oh, there we go. Okay, Steve, I can see you. <laughs> so, Ke Ke Kelly and Steve are in the laboratory just across the street right now. Now, before we get started, you guys, I want to, I'm going to talk a little bit about atom traps, and then I'll get back to you in about one minute, okay? OK. Um, now, as I said, to do quantum mechanics, you have to isolate your system from the environment. We don't want anybody making measurements. We don't want anything living or not living making measurements or interacting. So in, in the laboratory across the street, we have a system where we've done that. We've shielded a very simple quantum system, like an atom, from everything. We put it in a vacuum chamber so we get rid of all the air. And we allow it to float between electrodes so that it's not hitting surfaces. Now, you might ask, how do you do that? Uh, in fact, there's a lot of black magic in doing that, but I can, I can show you a little bit of how that works. Now, the atoms that we trap are charged. They have an electric charge on them. And so we're going to apply electric fields as force fields to hold them in one place. Now, it turns out that electric fields are very difficult to point in the right direction to hold a charge. And the analogy I like to make is very much like trying to support a tennis ball with a bunch of hoses. If you go in the backyard and you have if you, have, if you have 100 hoses, however many you want, um, it's very difficult to suspend that tennis ball. You might think that, well, I'm, I'm just going to apply six hoses in all the six directions, you know, from the top, from the bottom, left and right, from the back and from the front. Put the tennis ball in the middle there and it'll sit there. Well, actually, no. What will happen is the water will form, well, it, it'll be, everybody's going to get wet because the water is going to splash everywhere and it's going to take the tennis ball with it eventually. So it, it turns out electric force fields are much like water. It's hard to force them all into one place. They squirt out. And the analogy we have is a, if you can see this, it's a, it's a saddle. We'll go on to camera number three. Oh, input number four. Thanks, Warren. And this is a very smooth potato chip or saddle, whatever you want. Um, and it's very much like electric fields. We can have it, and I'm going to put a ball on this. We can make an electric field uh, uh, point inward in one dimension. That's fine. The, the atom will be trapped in that dimension. But it's going to squirt out, I promise you, in the other dimension, just like this. I can see it's going to fall down the, the, the uh, dimension of the saddle here that's not holding it. So the force we're using here is gravity. And we're shaping gravity, in a sense, with this funny surface. Okay? So this is not a very good trap at all for marbles. It's going to fall down that direction. It's good in one dimension, but not in two. Uh, forget about the third dimension. We need, we need all three dimensions, though. So it turns out. Uh, if you can, as, as you may have guessed with this funny contraption, this saddle is mounted on an old record player, <clears throat> an old LP player, if, if anybody knows what that is anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is actually the, the motor here was the drive, it was the record player I grew up on, an old console, uh, so it has special meaning to me. But <laughs> so you can see nicely that the saddle is moving up and down. And at first glance, you're going to think, well, that's not very exciting. The saddle is up and it's down. On average, it's nothing. On average, it's just like this. The marble's not really going to be trapped. It's going to, if, if there's any little bit of tilt, it's going to fall off. That's no good, especially in the laboratory. If we have an atom that has a little tiny tilt, after a microsecond, it's going to hit the wall. And we have to start all over again. Well, it turns out that things are a little more complicated. You don't get to average this saddle to zero. It's, it's, more, more, it's, it's, it's a lot trickier than that. You have to average the motion of the marble. And when you put a marble on this, surprisingly, it stays. Of course, it's rolling and spinning and so forth. There's friction, all kinds of nasty things going on. But you can see it's oscillating. It's staying trapped, though. 
And I, I want to point to this because this is exactly the type of a force field we apply in the laboratory. Okay? So this is going to be our atom. And this, this funny shaped surface is going to act as our, as our electric field force. Now, everything's a lot smaller with the atom. The, the, the electrodes are only, or they're under a millimeter in size. But that's pretty big if you blow it up with a microscope. Hello, everybody. OK. So um, I've just projected the image of the oscilloscope. In fact, if you can see in the laboratory, that little oscilloscope there, we've blown that up over here. And this is a TV picture of a, a single atom. This is live. It's right across the street. And that brightness, that bright blob, is one atom that's giving off light because we're shining laser radiation on that atom at just the right wavelength so that it re-emits the light. After all, that's how we see anything. You see me because you're actually looking at the light that's bouncing off me. So we're doing the same thing at the single atom level. And by the way, a millimeter on this scale is, uh, let's see, I guess a millimeter is pretty much from here all the way to the other side of the room. So this is pretty small, but not terribly small. And the reason we can see a single atom is that there's nothing else there. It's just like this marble. It's in the middle of free space. It's dark everywhere. The atom is the only thing there. And so that's why we can see it. Also, the atom is very cold. It's at the bottom of that bowl through something called the magic of laser cooling. We're able to prepare that atom right down at the bottom. Now, things get more interesting because I'm going to show you how this atom can behave as a quantum bit. Now, atoms, as you may know, have, can be very complicated. There's lots of energy levels inside of an atom. In fact, this atom, if you wanted to know, it's, um, the species is ytterbium, YB. It's a very heavy atom. It has, uh, it has some, I don't know, 90 protons and 80 neutrons and uh, about 90 electrons in it. So it's a very heavy atom, and we're, 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 we're we're pretty much exciting one of those electrons with a laser beam, and it's the electrons relaxing and giving off light. Now, that single electron can be in two states. It can be in two different energy levels, and that's going to hold our information. And uh, in fact, we're going to now uh, sh show you the difference between a zero and a one in that atom. And it turns out, remember rule number one and two of quantum mechanics. We can do rule number one by applying microwaves to this atom. We can prepare both zero and one. For us, rule number two is going to be bright or dark. Is the atom bright or dark? One of the states, when we measure it, will be bright. We measure it with a laser beam. And when we use the same laser beam, if the atom is in the other state, it will be dark. So it couldn't be clearer, the difference between zero and one in this atom. <clears throat> OK, Steve, Kelly. Are we ready to uh, put the microwaves on? Yeah, sure. Oh, actually, you know, before we do that, just to prove that we're not pulling a fast one here, um, why don't you block one of the laser beams? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Or, or I want to, uh, oh, uh, maybe we should just go over, the, skip over that stuff. No, I wanted to uh, prove to the audience here that this is real, and I want you to block one of the laser beams. The 935 beam would be fine. And you'll see that atom goes out. So we're just blocking the, the, the flashlight, turning off the room lights, basically. You can't see anything. OK, thanks. Now, that darkness, the atom was still there while it reappeared. It's still there. That same atom is there all day, in fact. We've, we've had single atoms in this device for several days, even up to a week. The same atom. It just sits there. Um, so, so now, uh, Steve and Kelly, we're, we're going to apply microwaves and, and uh, prepare zero and one, and go back and forth between the two. So here, this data is not running just yet, but they're going to start this program going. It's going to chunk along. Um, and one is bright, zero is dark. And it looks like uh, we're in the dark state here. This, this bar tells you dark, and number one is bright. And when it's not displaying, I don't know what that means. But I, I, the, data, the data is just coming in real slowly. <clears throat> so you can see it's dark. You can't see the atom. And in fact, the, the brightness level is dark. 
There's a lot of reasons why it could be dark, though, so I'm a little concerned. <laughs> Okay. Go ahead, Steve, and tell us what you're doing. Okay, so uh, right now we're running a uh, running a series of lens pulses for a short of pumping it up down into the dark state. And uh, as you can see on the screen, I think um, you know we get very we get almost zero is our value all the time. Now I turn on a uh, a microwave pulse, so now we pump the eye. Uh, you might say why we can't see it on the oscilloscope. It's a much more sensitive counter. And so now he's going to set up a microwave pulse to couple back and forth. And so this is a quantum bit in action. You can clearly see the difference between the two states in a single atom. But we haven't proven this is, there's anything quantum about this. This could be a regular old transistor, 0 and 1. And so what they're going to do now is show how you can oscillate back and forth between the two, very much like a wave. There we go. OK, so they're chunking along. It started dark. Now it got bright. You can see it's coming back down. This is basically an interference process. The atom is continuously going back and forth in between the two. The interesting point is when you go halfway. Now, if they stop halfway, again, we're making a superposition of both bright and dark states, but the atom is never half bright. It's always either heads or tails. It's never in between, whatever that means. And we can see that by stopping halfway in the middle here and doing other experiments showing that, in fact, rule number one is active here. And we can turn off rule number one and then turn on rule number two. And we can have great control going back and forth. OK. OK, Steve and Kelly, I think we're all set. Thanks. OK, thanks. Uh... OK, over and out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um. <clears throat> so that was a, that that was a a quantum bit in action, and um, I want I want to point out one property of quantum computers that that that's incredibly important, and I. Again, there's just so much to talk about. It's something called entanglement. And I kind of hinted on this in the sense that, remember, we had these weird waves of a baseball being in two places at once. Well, um, if, it's, if it's in ordinary atmospheric conditions, the air molecules get involved. And in fact, in, in quantum mechanics, we say that the air becomes entangled with the baseball. It, it gets sucked into the system. And again, when the air hits the wall or does not hit the wall, the wall gets sucked into the system. Entanglement is a property of quantum mechanics that uh, allows quantum computers to work. And I want to return to this, this ambiguous perspective of the cube and, and motivate what Einstein called spooky action at a distance, this entanglement. And what, what's happening is um, we, we tend to think of this ambiguous perspective as sort of a superposition. Again, it's, 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 hard to, it's hard to have an analogy that really works in the classical world. We have to just take, take it on faith that quantum mechanics behaves this way. Um, but we see both up and to the right and down to the left here. 
And uh, typically your mind, this is a little like rule number one. There's a superposition. Rule number two is when your mind locks onto one perspective. That's a little like rule number two. And when your mind locks onto it, it stays there, usually. You can, of course, start over again, close your eyes, or you can have it flip back and forth. But, you know, the analogy is not perfect. So a definite perspective happens. That's like rule number two. Now, what is entanglement? Entanglement is something that happens when you have more than one system, more than one qubit, more than one quantum bit. This would be like a single quantum bit here. Here's entanglement. <laughs> we have two of them, two separate cubes. They're both ambiguous, but most of you will see that these two cubes have the same perspective. Either they're both up and to the right or they're both down and to the left. <clears throat> um, the interesting thing about this type of connection is that these cubes are completely independent. Why does your mind pick them to be the same perspective? Well, in fact, you'll see that. You'll, you'll, you'll see that they're the same. And what's hard to motivate is that um, even though these cubes can be really far apart, um, they can still be linked in the quantum mechanical sense. And so quantum entanglement is unlike anything, anything at all in classical physics because this linkage can persist over very long distances. And this is why Einstein was very spooked about this. He, as you know, um, was the, the fellow who put together the fact that nothing goes faster than the speed of light. Well, if I have an entangled, so-called entangled superposition, these two cubes are linked. There's nothing preventing me from taking one of them and putting it on, putting it on Jupiter. Maybe you can take it to Jupiter, and I'll stay here with this one. But again, uh, this analogy kind of falls apart there. But imagine that the correlation remains, even at long distances. As soon as I look at my perspective, down to the left, for instance, I know that yours is down to the left also. This, there's, there's sort of a hidden wiring between the two systems. And that hidden wiring is what makes a quantum computer work. I think a better example, since we're maybe comfortable now with the idea of uh, superpositions of things, let's, let's think of two coins, heads or tails, each of them. But quantum mechanically, we could prepare these two coins in a superposition of having both heads and having both tails. And we can take our two pennies and go to the opposite sides of the universe. And this is what puzzled Einstein. As soon as I see heads, I know by rule number two that this is the only case it could be. In other words, you have heads. If I see tails, you have tails. And uh, in fact, I know that fact much faster than the speed of light could traverse the distance. And so this is what he called spooky action at a distance. Um, now it turns out the resolution of that so-called paradox is that there's no information flow when I do that. But there is something very interesting about that. And, and again, I can't, I'd love to talk much more about quantum entanglement, except to note that if you have good control of quantum systems, you can entangle them and, and realize extra wiring that's not available to a mere classical computer like this laptop. Okay. Um, quantum computing is a big deal. It's, uh, and, and I would say it's a big deal because nobody really knows what the limits are. And in fact, the simplest quantum computers consist of something like this, a few atoms, very simple, almost, almost trivial. But we think we know how to scale things up. And uh, this is an old cartoon from, from Dilbert here who is, is poking fun at, at the way we look at quantum mechanics. Some people think that rule number two of quantum mechanics, remember the measurement, you get one or the other. What's actually happening, there's nothing strange. What's actually happening is rule number two means that the universe is splitting. <clears throat> And you're experiencing one, and uh, the other universe experiences the other. So I get the heads here, the tails is in the other universe. And because I'm in this universe, I didn't see the tails. Okay. So that's called the many universes interpretation. And he's poking a little fun here. He's built a machine that can sample other universes. Um, but, but what we're really after is putting together lots of atoms. And this is a picture of about 1,000 atoms, each glowing very much like I showed you. What we had was just one dot here. But this is about 1,000 atoms in a disk. And unfortunately, a system even that big, we can't quite control the quantum states so well. But we think we know how to do this. It will involve lots of uh, inroads in technology in the coming years. Um, so uh, quant quantum <laughs> computing and quantum inform information science may even get into the, into the life sciences and biology. 
This is actually, if those, those of you know what The Onion magazine is, it's a, it's a very funny magazine uh, that, that comes out on college campuses, and you, you get that type of a humor. Uh, but uh, uh, quantum information science is a really big deal these days. And uh, unfortunately, though, it, it, it's possible to take it too far. Um, and <laughs> there, there are several books out there that seem to want to describe everything that's strange about nature as quantum mechanics. For instance, uh, ESP, uh, extrasensory perception. Uh, in this one here, uh, this book by Dana Zohar called The Quantum Society, um, well, it's the, what I like about the book is there's not a single equation in the book. But that's also what I don't like about the book, I guess. Um, but she's trying to explain the fact that sometimes we all notice in life that, let's say th these two people were twins at birth, and one's in the UK, one's in Oxford, and they're doing the same thing at the same time, it seems. They must be entangled. <laughs> so so you know, it, it's possible to take this too far. Uh, but I think the point is made that, the, that, that quantum mechanics is very strange, that, that the observer plays a role in the physics, that we can have strange things, existence in two different realities at the same time. And in fact, this, this objection that Einstein had in 1935, he published a paper. And uh, it had to do with how we define reality. And quantum mechanics calls us to question very uh, uh, philosophical uh, points like that. And uh, so I can understand why people want to learn a little bit about quantum mechanics and then go, go off the deep end and try to describe everything in society in terms of quantum mechanics. But um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm just about done. And I, one of, the, one of my, my heroes in quantum mechanics, but also in quantum information science, is Richard Feynman, who in his later years toyed with the idea of making quantum circuits and making uh, quantum computers, although he didn't, uh, unfortunately, he died before, before uh, 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 big applications for quantum computing came out. But this is what he said back in the, um, uh, back 20 or 30 years ago about the status of quantum mechanics. And uh, he says, we have always had a great deal of difficulty in understanding the worldview that quantum mechanics represents. OK, I'm still nervous with it. It has not yet become obvious to me that there's no real problem. I cannot define the real problem. Therefore, I suspect there's no real problem, but I'm not sure there's no real problem. <laughs> So to me, to, to have such a high-powered theoretical physicist say that, there must be something interesting about quantum mechanics. And this, I think, will play out in the 21st century, and we're just beginning. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible in part by Pfizer. <laughs>